Oh, uh, welcome, welcome to the Libertarian Alliance meeting. We meet here every month, and you're invited to every uh, meeting. Uh, tonight we have uh, Christian Michel, who's talking about what should we think about politics today. Is that right, Christian? Or how to think? How to think about uh, yeah. politics today? Big <laughs> <laughs> I always get it wrong, so I don't try. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Christian. Okay, thank you very much, and, and thank you for coming. And um, I'm not really sure how to think about politics. So uh, it's going to be a sort of exercise uh, that we'll do together, trying to uh, make some sense. I'm trying to take a different approach. I'm not going to talk about elections, political parties, prime ministers, and, and so on. I'm not really interested in, in that. But I will try to uh, look at uh, politics in a more philosophical way. And a good place to start is generally the beginning. And um, the beginning of my little story uh, tonight is uh, with the early Neolithic uh, age. And at that time, uh, there happened two transformations. The first one was uh, to move from, a, um, uh, from tribal areas to agriculture with the domestication of animals. And the domestication of animals must have been, for our early ancestors, an extraordinary experience because they discovered that living is malleable. With the right dosage of uh, carrot and sticks, you can get animals to do what you want them to do. In the same way, you can get plants uh, to grow and to um, cross-fertilize them and, and so on. So, in other words, this first idea, but especially animals, this first idea that you could turn what is savage, what is uncouth, what is um, a uh, very primitive, into something that would be tame. I think that certainly marked the, the conscience of our early ancestors. And of course, what we have is an early prefiguration <coughs> of what politics is. With the right amount of carrot and stick, you can get human beings in society to do what the leaders want them to do. And our political vocabulary reflects this. If you consider the way we talk of leaders, uh, we talk of guides, we talk of conducator, we talk of um, the leader maximo. In all languages, we have this idea that we are a herd, we are a flock, and we follow a shepherd. So that is the uh, idea, the first idea that we had of politics. Führer, Duce, um, someone who is standing in front of a crowd and telling them what to think and where to go. Actually, what I'm doing here. But I'm not telling you <laughs> where to go. I'm simply trying to push uh, across uh, certain ideas. Now, in the herd, in the early sort of... <clears throat> flock where you had you know sheep and cattle and so on you had a kind of hierarchy you had the uh, animals or warriors or uh, people who were more brave more adventurous who would be at the outside of a herd where they were exposed to danger exposed to predators but they got the green grass before it was trampled by the rest and inside the herd, you had the, uh, the children, you had the weaker elements of the, of the herd, of the flock, um, who would be protected. And we have this sort of thing in societies today. But it doesn't work exactly as it should, because natural selection doesn't operate the way it should. And this is what you know, I'm going to talk But the other about. But the second transformation, the other transformation, is that societies no longer were um, uh, differentiated, identified by their totem. The totem is, in, uh, if you read anthropologists, ethnologists, and so on, uh, the totem was the mythical ancestor of the individuals in the tribe. They were descendants of the wolf, descendants of the bear, descendants of the eagle. Um, uh, Levi Strauss, uh, the, um, Claude Levi Strauss, the anthropologist who studied this in the Amazonian basin, um, had this formula, which has remained quite famous, 
uh, Bororos are Araras. The tribe Bororos are Araras, parrots. And in a way, they identified with the parrots because they were all siblings. They were all brothers and sisters, literally, as descendants of this animal. But what it meant is that they couldn't absorb another tribe. They couldn't merge with another group because these were not the same blood. They were not the same animals. So it was impossible to amalgamate, and these tribes remained very small. But when these ancestors of ours moved from worshipping no longer a totem, but an idol, the idol was not identified by blood. It was simply the, um, the uh, sort of supernatural uh, element that you wanted to uh, follow. And you, you, all you needed to is, is worship the idol. And what was very important at that time, and which is still important today when you think about uh, politics, is that the idol w accepts everybody under its protection, provided you negate your desire, provided you offer your desire to the idol. Now, if I go around people in the street and I say, you know, I love opera. Could you give me money to buy a ticket to the opera? That's my desire. Very likely, I won't get a lot of money to buy a ticket to the opera. But if I go to the idol and I say, you know, it is important to have culture in society. It's no longer my desire, idol. It is a desire for the common good. It is a desire for the society. And then the idol would respond. If I am a farmer, a French farmer, and I say I want subsidies for my farm, that's not going to, to go. But if I say it is in the interest of a nation that we have safety for our food, for our supply of food and so on, then the idol will, will respond. In other words, we have to stop desiring. We have to transform our desires into something that is different, no longer ours, but the desire of the collective that then the uh, idol will satisfy, maybe or maybe not. Now, of course it is uh, the, the model that Hobbes has described in Leviathan. I mean, we give, we sacrifice our liberty in exchange for uh, safety. That model, that model is in crisis. And it has become, in a certain sense, it has become neurotic. Um, what is, in what sense is it a neurosis? Well, if you think of you know, the early works of Freud, where he defines uh, neurosis uh, typically by the Oedipus complex. Now, it's a foundation stone of psychoanalysis. And the way it works, as you all know, but I'm simply going to repeat it, just that you know, we, we try to make, make sense of it when it, we apply it to the whole of society. There is, in the young boy, a, a desire that is indicible, inexprimable, which is to be his mother's lover. And that the, the only lover. And that causes that a, a, a problem in the sense that the mother is also the, uh, uh, loved by the father. It's a problematic problem which can only be resolved if you kill the father. And the false declared aim at this horrific thought, can I accept consciously that I want to kill my father? is disguised by the other uh, aim, which is, I love my father. So you have something which is totally unacceptable, which is transformed into something that is exactly the reverse, I love my father. Now, if you think of the state, and again, I'm you know, throwing these ideas, the state has the same sort of conflicting aims. 
The basic indicible aim is I want to increase my power. That is what states do. That is in the nature of a beast. I mean, they increase their power. And of course, you cannot go around and say, you know, uh, I want to increase my power. Support me. That doesn't gain much traction. So the problematic aim is to retain power using coercion, extortion, and so on to consolidate your power, but with a forced declared aim, which is like, I love my father, a false declared aim, which is, I am the agent of a common good. I am there not to exert power over you. I am there to be of service to you, to be of service to the collective. Now, of course, these aims are incompatible. You cannot increase your power and be of service to the collective and use extortion and so on to consolidate your power. But there, there can be no sort of common good coming out of violence. Karen Orney, who is an early American psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and um, who uh, wrote a um, book uh, in 1946, Our Inner Conflicts, she gives a, a very interesting description of people who are victims of that neurosis. She said, one way of attempting to solve our inner conflicts is by creation of an image. It is what the neurotic believes himself to be. The image is removed from reality, <coughs> but its influence on the person's life is very real indeed. To the extent that the image is unrealistic, it tends to make the person arrogant. In the original meaning of the word, to arrogate oneself qualities that one does not have. The more unrealistic the image, of course, the more vulnerable the person, avid for outside confirmation and recognition. I think it's a pretty good description of our leaders and, and shepherds. Now, the political crisis we are in today is not terribly dissimilar, I suggest, to the crisis that the patient goes through as he or she deals with their demons as they become adults. And as subjects of political states, we are becoming adults. Like teenagers, becoming adults causes anxiety, frustration, resentment. We have parents who no longer understand us. We have parents that we would like to get free from, but at the same time, we want the parents to continue paying our flat or I mean, studio, uh, paying for our expenses, things like that. We are conflicted. That is what teenagers go through. And we want freedom, and at the same time, we realize that the state, the modern state, the state that we live in the West, the kind of welfare, social democratic state, is abandoning us. The welfare state no longer fulfills its promises, which is a very big problem in the sense that we have lived on that um, promise for the last five or six uh, decades. The shepherd taking, taking care of his flock, from the lambing to the slaughterhouse, as our leaders claim to do for us, from cradle to grave, that image seems to be in peril. And this is one of the crises of our time, which I'll try to shed light on. For, for the state to take care of us means big, costly governments. And yet, most people feel like outsiders. They are looking from the street, the party that is going on inside. Workers, the small guys, I mean the middle class, remains locked out of the favored sections of the economy in which income, wealth, power, fun are concentrated. So we are, we feel this exclusion, this frustration, this humiliation, this insecurity, the no future that we find in a no-growth economy, which has become our economy. Uh, millions of tragedies, of anxieties, 
of fear of incapacity, of worthlessness, is what we feel, in many people feel, in society. And of course, the main demand that people have is they want to be exploited, paradoxically. They want jobs. They want to work. And governments don't create jobs. The only people who create jobs, actually, are pregnant women. They are women who deliver babies into the world. They are the babies who will require that we work. They, they, they will require food. They will require shelter. They will require education. They will require all the things, the health care and so on, that will provide jobs to other people. And what governments can do is recruit civil servants. That is not creating growth. Because as they are paying for these civil servants, they have to take money from other people who are then no longer offering jobs to other people. So people understand the cost of a system and they fear that it has become unsustainable. We have the taxes of a war economy without the war. So the natural outcome of this, the natural consequence of this, is what we read every day in the press. Companies, individuals, rich individuals leave. Tax avoidance, even tax evasion. And it's almost a natural reaction, which Bertolt Brecht, paradoxically, Bertolt Brecht expressed very well. He said, why should we love specifically the country where we pay our taxes? There is a sense of loyalty that existed before, that existed during the periods of crisis and, and so on, a sense of loyalty in times of war that we no longer have. And we, you know, many people feel this sort of nostalgia, especially in this country, the spirit of a blitz. Now, isn't it pathetic that in order to recreate the sense of solidarity, we have to call the, the remembrance, the uh, memory, of when we were under bombs. In the past, the idol had many different discourses. Bring civilization to the savages. That was the project of the empire, British, French, and others. The burden, the white man's burden, establish the supremacy of the white race or the Aryans very bad memories of that. Accomplish the socialist revolution. Defend democracy against the socialist revolution. These were all projects of the idol. Today, almost everywhere in the West, the only project is a redistribution of wealth. A very materialist, a very boring, maybe something that has worked for a certain time, had a certain appeal, but is so accounting-wise, is so being counting that you cannot be inspired. You cannot be transformed. You cannot consider that is, this is our mission in life, simply to transfer the money, Peter's money, uh, to Paul. But it is the only legitimacy, the only discourse that gives legitimacy to the state today. It's become, the idol has become monotheistic. There is only one discourse. And it's, whereas it's not a great uplifting, a great inspiring cause, um, it, we need still the docility of citizens who accept to keep that system. And the problem, of course, is how do you achieve this obedience from citizens in something that cannot be transfiguring, that cannot be energizing. The first approach, the first discourse of our leaders is to say, now don't laugh, is to say we are all in it together. Now, this appeal to the nation this appeal to solidarity because there would be you know, one boat and we would be all rowing in, in, in that boat. Is the strategy put forward 
mostly by reactionary parties, the anti-progress parties. I mean, UKIP, the National Front in, Fran in France, many others. It is actually identity politics. These politicians manipulate our human proclivity to help people who are like us in the same cultural genetic boat, the same herd. And that's where social democrats have a problem, in the sense that their cosmopolitanism, their internationalism, means that they cannot argue for redistribution and at the same time say, well, we want to welcome the poor of the world. Uh, the more people are invited to the feast, the least each one will get. And um, the second argument is to defend an inherited way of life. It's been our culture, it's been our tradition, this is the way we do things, you know, in Greece, in Italy, and so on. We, you know, we, that's how we have always done it. And that, of course, conflicts in the globalized world we are in today uh, with the need to imitate successful nations, nations that are more productive, whether we like it or not, are able to um, bring forward goods, innovation, and so on, that are challenging the traditional ways of life. And if you cannot um, rise up to the challenge, you are going to be slowly excluded from prosperity and, and growth. We want the universal adoption of these best practices. And again, it's in the Communist Manifesto. Capitalism compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, i.e. to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. It's not bad. In a way, I would like the Afghani to become bourgeois. I would like the people in ISIS and so on to become bourgeois. Um, it's the thing that we will have to deal with in the sense that there will be this competition of lifestyles and so on. And we have to see whether we can accommodate this. I'll come back to this in, in a minute. And besides the appeal to nationalism, besides the appeal to, you know, we are all in the same boat, there is a more radical way of creating obedience, creating this sort of solidarity. It's fear. Nothing brings the errant sheep back to the flock under the crook of a shepherd than the cry of a wolf. Let power declare we are at war and everyone genuflects to power. Politics in that sense is the continuation of war by other means. Randolph Bourne, an American poet in the trenches of 1917, has written this very famous quote, but I don't re resist the temptation to read it again. War is the health of a state. It automatically sets in motion throughout society those irresistible forces for hum uniformity, for passionate cooperation with the government in coercing into obedience individuals who lack the larger herd sense. The larger herd sense. Think of the Patriot, Patriot Act in America, the worst aggression against freedom in the history of the United States. But think of you know, all what we are um, subjected to in France, in this country, in, you know, elsewhere, because there are terrible terrorists out there. Um, Mencken, the wonderful Mencken, says, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and thus clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. Now, we have in France, I mean, the most incompetent nincompoon whip president that we've had in you know, the last 100 years. But immediately after 
I mean, he had the lowest popularity rating of any president in the Fifth Republic. The day after the terrorist attack, three weeks ago, his popularity rating surged. People said, we need a leader. We need a boss. Um, another fear brandished besides the threat of war is fear of a future. And there is an interesting reversal of a front there. Throughout the 19th and the 20th century, the people who are showing us the future, the people who are telling us, look, it's going to be a radiant there. This is where we want to go. This is where science takes us. This philosophy of the, of the Enlightenment was propagated, carried by intellectuals, by scientists, by artists. They were the ones who were showing the way to the future. And the people who were in the back, who were saying, oh, wait, 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 were the people with money. They were the conservatives. They were the people who, were, who feared for the existent that it might be changed. Whereas the others feared of the existent, saying there is exploitation, they are bad things, and they were. Now, we have a reversal of the front. The people who are saying us, it's dangerous, the future, we don't like it. Are the intellectuals, are the people who are saying, look, there is a danger of global warming, uh, GM foods, uh, all these sort of, you know, androids who are going to become like human beings. I don't know. I mean, they are, they are no longer believing in the promises of science and technology. And the people who are pushing us into the future are the people with money. They are the venture capitalists. That is quite an extraordinary reversal of what used to be. The left are become, have become the new reactionaries. You know, they hang on to all the, what they, all the things that we have done in the last 40 years and so on, whereas you have this new class of young technophiles of Silicon Valley and so on, who say, you know, let's forget all this. I mean, we can do a better world um, and everybody will benefit. And I think everybody will, but that is something else. The third fear that is instilled by the state establishment is the fear of alternatives. Governments have given up, really. I mean, what they say, their discourse, is to say, look, we've messed up. It doesn't work, but hey, anything else would work even less. Anything else would be worse. It was the idea of Fukuyama. I mean, Fukuyama is recounted since, but when you know, he wrote this book about the end of history, what he was saying is, this is it. We have achieved the best we can get. Now, hang on. 5,000 years of revolution, of wars, of you know, battles of all kinds on all fronts, to achieve this? I mean, this is pathetic. This is the worst possible outcome we could imagine. But that is what we get. That is what we are told. There can be nothing better than what we have. There is no alternative. We live under the dictatorship of Tina. Now, they call it the third way. I call it surrender. I call it, you know, we're thrown in the towel. They call it pragmatism and meaning they muddle through. They have no idea, no program, no project, no philosophy, no ideal, no aspiration, no imagination, no dream. Why should anyone follow these shepherds? We are in a crisis, and the word crisis, the etymology of the word, I looked it up in the dictionary, comes from the Greek. It's a word that gave us in English, the root that gave us in English the word critique. A crisis is when you look back and you critique what you have done. 
you look back and you say, where did we mess up? Where did we fail? Why are we in this state? And when it doesn't work, then the rational thing to do is say, try something else. Try the alternative. How did this change happen? And when we look at history, major changes until the Enlightenment, until the Industrial Revolution, major changes came through calamity, through wars, through revolutions, invasion, pandemics, violent and savage upheavals. That's what, is, that's what caused changes. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, in a way, I hate to use these words, but I mean, you know, we all use them. Capitalism. Capitalism and markets loosen the dependence of change on accidents of nature and human folly. That's what freedom is about. It is a freedom to experiment. It is a freedom to try. And progress depends on this freedom to experiment. What markets do is that they incorporate innovation as the very agent of change. They foster constant incremental changes all the time. So all the time there, is, there are these new ways of doing things. There's these new lifestyles, these new artists, there's new music, there's new... Um, and we, uh, that is what you know, a free society does. It raises the temperature of change. It quickens the, it quickens the tempo of change into a permanent revolution, a peaceful one. It is what Schumpeter said, creative destruction, but a peaceful creative destruction. And markets undermine the entrenched schemes of social division, hierarchies, dogmas, all the groups who are insulated, were insulated against challenges. What imagination does is that it spares us the crisis. Innovation makes global crisis unnecessary. And changes in capitalism come from anywhere. Young kids in a garage somewhere people in labs, artists in, you know, country that we couldn't locate on the map, um, lifestyle that we had not imagined. That is what a market does. It is an act of faith in the constructive powers of the ordinary men and women. Not just the imagination, inventiveness of committee of rulers, bureaucrats and experts, everyone is invited to experiment, to discover, to try, to fail, to try again, and in order to get a better chance to live a big life, a big life, transfigured by ambition, by surprise, by struggle. Markets is about the self-affirmation of ordinary humanity happen here, happening in China, happening everywhere. It is a commitment to lift everyone to make them greater. Prosperity has to be spiritual as well as practical. It's the progress for the entire human being to make a better use of our energies, to establish in the minds of ordinary men and women the idea of experience in their own power. Because to humanize a society is really to energize it. And in the sense, globalization helps because we are concurrent experiences of development. Dissenting individual and groups um, emerge, challenge the existent, and the role of national differences among nations is to present a form of moral specialization. Each one, each country, 
each groups within countries can experiment based on their on the legacy of their culture, the legacy of their heritage, and, and so on, um, so that we get this extraordinary uh, diversity of experiments. Not the globalization of the IMF and, and you know, Davos and the global elite um, that they offer to you know, the well-behaved uh, masses. But what we want is a struggle, a struggle that is rooted in the specificity of choices made by different countries in competition with others. New ways to explore. Cooperatives, free banking, um, tax competition, zero patent, no IP protection, all sorts of you know, different ways, <coughs> communism, whatever, different ways of experimenting and showing us, look, this is what we are doing. Do you want to join us? Do you like it? Do you want to adopt it where you are? More opportunities in more ways, each one group, each group, playing its comparative advantage so that after some time, this diversity will become as natural as the distribution of climate in the physical world. Now, in order to achieve that, capitalism must be imposed on capitalists. We don't have capitalism. I've used this word for, you know, in, in, in the last five minutes. But what we have is a coalition between people with money and people with gun. Um, and guess who loses? Those who have neither. Capitalists are sheltered from the process that I was describing earlier of being outside of a herd. They want the green grass, but they don't want predation. They don't want the discipline of um, uh, natural selection. They want to be protected, bailed out, subsidized, privileged. So that doesn't work. This is what we need to change in order to bring about the more creative society that I was talking about. A last word on austerity. Austerity won't work, and we don't want austerity. We want prosperity. But growth comes in two stages. It comes first from the ability to cooperate, a cooperation between human beings that is welcoming to innovation, to new technologies, lifestyle, artistic, and, and so on. And accepting the new always threatens the old. And the key in cooperation today, and if there is a play, if there is a part for politics, it would be this. It would be how to maintain the truce between the winners and losers in the game of innovation. How to maintain a, uh, the peace between taxicabs and Uber, between Hilton and Airbnb, between the old hierarchies and the new emerging groups of, you know, technophiles, and then so on. But longer-term growth, longer-term growth, comes from the application of knowledge. The purpose of science is to bring to the market the knowledge and goods that didn't exist. That's what science is about. It is to routinize as much work as possible so that the routinized work can be performed by a machine that amplifies our human power. So we shift our attention to what cannot be repeated, uh, to what is truly creative. That is what lifts us from the littleness of everyday life. And for vast numbers of people, the occasion of being lifted out of that littleness, that banal uh, everyday life, has been war. The chance to become a hero, or to appear to, to, appear to others as a hero, uh, the prestige of a uniform, the sacrificial devotion 
to the idol, followed by slaughter. Let me read from a book by an MP who died recently, Leo Abse. It's a book published in the year 2000 with a titillating title, Fellatio, Masochism, Politics and Love. Couldn't have invented it. This is what he says. I have a profound sense of envy. Why should these men, simply through a chrono chronological accident, have had the chance to serve their country so courageously, whereas our own generation, my generation, has been consigned to live in an era that history will quickly forget. It is impossible not to feel a sense of nihilism about an age in which the biggest issues seem to be about interest rates and ministers' nocturnal activities, rather than life and death, war and peace. It is hard to find much purpose in the modern era, shorn as it has been, of sacrifice and danger. This is the obscenity of politics. What is finally changing in, and gives us hope for the future is that we no longer need wars in order to take us out of the small life. In Bertolt Brecht's play, um, Galileo, the young Andrea, thinking along the lines of Leo Absis, uh, which I've just read, deplores, cursed is the land that has no hero. To which Galileo replies, no, cursed is the land that needs heroes. There are still heroes today. The creative men and women working for profit or in social enterprise, in NGOs, people who design, produce, and offer us the products of their imagination and labor that make our environment more beautiful, more poetic, more practical, and more exciting. These are our heroes. Thank you very much. Any questions or criticisms? Bob? Just to get the ball rolling, I've sometimes objected, mostly to myself, about the, about the term um, creative destruction. Mm -hmm. Especially as a couple uh, sure, of mainly the market process. One yep. thing about the market process is that almost everything gets used, cycled, not recycled, cycled, used again. Um, there is money to be made in shifting dust, as Dickens, uh, one of the Dickens novels pointed out, to find good things in it. There are some good things in dust and rags and bones. These things are used. It's not creative destruction, how can I put it? It's certainly creative, but nothing is destroyed. Not, not literally destroyed, as in a war. That is destruction. But mostly with um, the market process, the new uses are found for old things. Old, old methods are, if you like, destroyed, or rather, freely given over, freely um, let go. There is very little destruction at all. Indeed, we find that people get older, fatter, live longer. Yeah, well, that's... Uh, that's... Where, where does the destruction hit? Um... There is, you've just said it. I mean, there is destruction in the sense that you have brownfields, you have uh, businesses that become uneconomical to run, and factories are abandoned, and then so on. Not all, not everything is recycled. And actually, this is one of the problems today: is the amount of waste, and an enormous amount of waste, um, which is the consequence of the big problem that we've inherited from. Keynes, which is this reversal of the engine of the economy from production, which was what we had throughout the 19th century and so on, to consumption. After Keynes, Keynes said, you know, what drives the economy is not the producer, the entrepreneur, the capitalist, what drives the economy, the economy is a consumer. And um, so, which is absurd. I mean, you cannot consume what you have not produced. But that was Keynes's idea. And this created the uh, consumer economy that we've had since the 1950s that has been analyzed by Marcus and, and you know, many others, and which is that 
generation of waste. This huge amount of things that you know, are constantly thrown onto the market and then thrown into landfills. Hmm. Yeah. Can I reply? Well, there's no one else putting their hand up. No one else putting their hand up. I'm looking at my own waste, which I can still do. Um, I'm not sure this is true. Really? I don't know. I, I don't think so. Um, uh, there are de desperate attempts to recycle, for example, uh, glass bottles. Now, glass is made of sand, and uh, there's an awful lot of sand about. And, uh, and um, fossil fuel is also useful in this regard. So most of the time, unless it's subsidized by the council, or people, t people take time and effort to get the sticky labels off their bottles, whatever it is, most of the time, the separation of glass at the council level is very often tipped into one big thing later on and turned into dark glass, because they can't use it for, um, for light glass. They can't rely on the fact that there won't be one, one brown or green bottle in the, in, in the thing. It's not worth the cost of separating them out. So that, that's, by the way, that's one yeah. point about that. Uh, but that will do. I, I don't think there's a great deal of waste, because waste was, in the third world it still goes on, it's infestation, it's rats, it's loss of crops, it's loss in storage, it's loss in transport, it's loss that, in that from that end, the modern world is far less wasteful. I mean, there's waste in the sense that people have things that could be, are still useful, and they throw them out, but then it would be wasteful not to have the new one. This is the, oh, this is a really contemporary old guy, and the people won't buy things because the price might be less next year. It's a silly argument. Partly because the price of oil has fallen. Fall. I mean, now here there's an appalling danger of deflation. I wish. <laughs> no, yeah. I wish. I, we agree on this. There is yeah. no there is <laughs> certain deflation. Yeah. But yeah, there's enough points in there. So. Mm. <laughs> Steve, uh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, uh, I mean, on, on the waste thing. I mean, uh, Christian, we, 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 we turn molecules and atoms from one form into another form which is useful to us. And when it's not being useful to us any longer, we dispense with it. But there's no particular reason why we should continually have to find new uses for one transformation of molecules and atoms. You know, it's, it, I think the, the, the word waste is a misnomer, really. OK. Um, the chap, the chap behind you, and then you afterwards. Robert, yeah. You first, yes. Robert. And yeah. you uh, well, it's true that clever people in garages have produced amazing results. But if we're talking, for example, about IT, I have the impression, and I may be, in fact, as a quote by Anne, that IT was essentially developed by the state and then either sold off or given away to private entrepreneurs. The same is true, I think, though I'm not sure, of all sorts of other uh, delightful uh, inventions and discoveries of modern life. So we, from, from the internet on the one hand to the agra on the other. Uh, the big pharma, for example, uh, uh, claims that it needs to charge a lot of money because it spends so much on research, but a lot of the basic research was done in the ivy halls of places like the University of London, and then was sort of sold off or given away to private entrepreneurs. Now, maybe that's not such a bad thing, but I think we both kind of think it is kind of a bad thing. Is there, and when we talk about alternative, what is the alternative to that? Well, there are two things. I mean, first of all, it's true that you know, many labs, many um, universities, many research departments have been funded by uh, the state. That's why we pay taxes. I mean, if our taxes had not at least produced that, what would have been the point of paying all these taxes? So we get something in return. The question is, would it have taken place if it had not been funded by the state? Maybe a bit later? <clears throat> Maybe never. We don't know. We, we cannot do alternative history. But I would suspect that a lot of the uh, technological innovation that we are enjoying today would have been funded uh, by venture capitalists, by you know, other people. Um, 
simply because uh, they were in the air, uh, there was a market for them, and it was simply accelerated because governments thought that it would be useful for their war effort. So um, that's it. So uh, yes, okay, fine, we pay taxes, and it so happens that the labs we founded delivered something that is useful. Big. Good. Yeah, if I can just come back to the subject of waste, but slightly generalize what we're mm -hmm. talking about with waste. Um, my view would be that the biggest waste that's happening at the moment is a waste of human time and energy. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, I remember visiting you when you were doing your Ofsted certification process. How much time of yours did that waste? that you could have used to do a proper job. Um, and I'm just wondering, and for example, another example, we pay for our in emails to be intercepted. Uh, another example, of of millions of billions of people in the third world who never get the chance to take part in the economy. Shouldn't we be looking to find ways to actually release and get rid of that kind of waste? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, yeah. I. I um... No, I'm not the person who is going to say, well, I have nothing to hide, therefore I don't mind people reading my email. Um, I think it's not polite. Yes. Um, <laughs> Patrick? Um, you seem to be saying, sort of, during your talk, that the 19th century was wonderful because there was explosion of talent and capitalism, and then at some point we got a welfare state which is very bad. What went wrong? Well, I think the welfare state was a necessary state, step. I think that, as you know, I do believe in you know, the Marxist narrative. I, I do believe that uh, you know, the, the history of the world is the history of class struggle. And um, it's, uh, I think Marx got one thing wrong in the sense that he didn't identify where the protagonist of the class struggle in the 19th century. I mean, Slave owners had political power. The law meant that their slaves were chattel to them. Uh, serves had political power. And the law made that you know, their serves were attached to the domain and so on. Marx has a problem explaining why workers um, are in the same situation, because workers are free to move, emigrate, you know, not work with this boss and go to work for that boss. And, and he said, you know, he sort of ridiculed this. He said, well, this is um, a uh, sort of abstract freedom. The concrete freedom is that they have to work. I think that he was lured into a uh, false understanding of uh, uh, what labor is by Adam Smith, Ricardo, you know, we, we, we all know this. In other words, he believed in the labor theory of value. <clears throat> and which blinded him to a very obvious exploitation, which is that you have a group of people who come with men in blue, armed and threatening, knocking on your door at five o'clock in the morning saying, you haven't paid us taxes, um, we are going to take you to jail. If that's not exploitation, what is? But the thing is, uh, at his time, first of all, there was very little of that going on. It was minimum state and, and so on. And as Marx himself explained, and then, you know, Gramsci and uh, Althusser and all these good people uh, said, well, it's the work of ideology. What ideology does is that it blinds you to the exploitation that you are suffering. Uh, it says, uh, you know, the church is necessary to bring you salvation, so you have to pay your teeth and, and so on to the church. Or the Lord is necessary for, you know, peace in the realm and so on, so you have to pay. So exploitation does this. I mean, how come 10% of a ruling class is not overthrown by 90%? Well, the 90% think, yes, the master is good. He doesn't beat me more often than I deserve. You know, so um, that is what we, we have been living under. We don't understand that this is exploitation. And um, it's, uh, but, but it is. 
Have I answered your question, or have I gone into on, on, on you, a tangent? Well, I, I, I'm not quite sure what went wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, is it just marks? Is that a, okay? Okay, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll say one thing. I'll say that another thing that Marx said is that you cannot jump steps. This is what people in you know Africa and so on have said. I mean, they wanted to say, well, we are going to move directly from uh, a um, uh, sort of middle age type economy based on agriculture and, you know, absolute monarchies and so on, to the 20th century. And we stop, we don't do industrialization and so on. And that failed, that failed dramatically. And so you have to go through all the steps. And the state has had, and still has, an enormous educating power. It has transformed our lives has made us, you know, has brought about a lot of changes in relationship. Thinks of, you know, think of, I don't know, gay rights, think of, uh, uh, you know, religion, secularism, or, I mean, all these sort of things, education and so on. It might have happened without the state, but the state did it. So, no, it didn't. Well, it did. It didn't. It did it. I mean, hang on a bit. Hang on a bit, Bob. There's a number of places. I know that. Well, it did. This is, the, the fact oh, that made a few bold statements, but okay, yeah, okay. But there's so, a number of speakers now. But we, we, we have it. I mean, it would be absurd to say, uh, well, you know, we are not going to drive on M4 because it was built by the state. Okay, that's that's my point. So the state did it. So we have to accept it. And I think it was a necessary step in order to move on to you know the next uh, phase, uh, which is to have a soft society, a society that is less harsh, a society that is less violent, a society that is less bluntly exploitative. That is what I think we aspire to. Sorry. Yes. So what would you say about self-interest? I, mean, I appreciate your arguments about how you know, people in the public sector exploit patriotism, um, you know, the common good in order to manipulate the public Right, for them and so on. But at the end of the day, they're all about the self interest uh, in the public sector. That is just rhetoric a lot of the time. Do you agree with that? Or do you, I mean, how can we stop that? Or how can we counter this self interest you know, within the political system that you know, is, 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 is not going away anytime soon? You know? so. Well, I like self interest. Yeah, I, do. I mean, yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, so um, the, uh, the, the example I often give is that altruism is really offensive. If I am in, you know, on my deathbed, or well, let's say on my you know, agonizing and, and so on, and you come to visit me, and you tell me, no, I do it by altruism. I really am not interested in it. I take no pleasure in visiting you. How does that leave me? I mean, I'll tell you, go away. You know, what we want is capitalist exchange. What we want is that you come and you say, look, Christian, you know, I'm very pleased to see you and so on. And I'm pleased to see you. So there is that sort of exchange that doesn't leave one of the parties in debt. Altruism leaves one of the parties in debt. So the way you do it, the way you use transformers is to say, well, God will balance the books. So you are no longer in debt because the person who has been charitable to you is going to get a recompense in you know, an afterlife or something like that. That's fine, but nobody believes this anymore. Well, a few people do in America. But the, it's, it's a different sort of... Um, it is a tough question. Sorry? It's a, it is a tough question. It's a tough, it's a big question. You can't do anything about it. No, but I mean, it's a, it's a good thing. I mean, after all, you know, why, why are we here? Don't we get some interest in what's happening here? I certainly do. I'm enjoying it. So I hope you do too. So in other words, we are here because we want our self-interest. If not, we would be, you know, leaving. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Paul, and then John. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, I thought that was probably one of the best talks I've heard on the virtues of free market capitalism. It was a light sort of Ayn Rand, but without all the terrible cod philosophy that uh, comes with that. 
Well, uh, and, and <laughs> does it come a lot of bad things? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, but I thought that was I thought that was pretty good. But uh, just a little bit more. Um, uh, one point you talked, you said um, that the states always want to increase its power. And um, there, are, there are various ways that states increase their power. If, if you were to ask people what's the most powerful state in the world, they'd probably say the United States of America, which is actually one of the more liberal places to live. Uh, okay. If you, okay. Uh, yeah, compared you, to... Com yeah, that was, else. Yeah, that was a good story. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but, uh, and, and say, in North Korea, you would probably say that that state has, its, has the most, exercises the most power directly over its own citizenry in controlling what its citizenry does. So the different sort of notions of power. Um, and it seems to me that there's, there's definitely a, a trade-off between power and the benefits of the market. The, the power is parasitical on the market. Uh, in the, you know, the, the, there's a temptation to rulers, they want to, they want to control, they want to press, but the more they do that, the more they're going to crush out the market, the poorer they are, and the smaller and grottier and more squalid and less powerful their little state becomes. So you end up like a little, you know, small, tiny, squalid dictatorship, you know, with absolute power supporting a dictatorship and all the elite live in fear. Well, you have the United States, which has sort of managed to sort of suck out as much money as it can from a sort of fairly liberal economy to give it some of the worldwide power. Before that, the British Empire, of course, which was previously the most powerful state in the world, and also that was quite liberal to live under, mm. compared to a lot of other places where it would have been more aggressive. Um, so it just seems to me that there is a kind of tension, I don't know if you have any reflections on that, but it seems to me there's a tension between if you are ruling a state, how much you want to sort of suck out of it and the, the various forces that, that apply. You know, you, you, if you become more liberal, but then you, if a state becomes more liberal and more free market, it, it, a, a, an organisation, you just tend to get, you tend to, it tends to encourage sort of power projection. The Euro European Union is now trying to project its power, and so the two seem to be encouraging each other. In a sort of a yes, you, you're right. I think that what happens is actually I was talking about this earlier today. Um, what, what happens is in the say West, we had a kind of agreement. I mean, it, it, it's not that, you know, we sat down and we decided this is how it's going to be done. It sort of evolved, evolved since Magna Carta, more or less. What happened is we have a state, a government, that applies laws that representatives of the people on which these laws would be applied um, create. They, they create the laws. Their representatives create the laws. So you have two bodies. One body that creates, legislates, and another body that applies the law. So the deal is this. The deal is you who apply the law may do only in your capacity, you may only do what the law requires you to do, demands that you do. We may do anything that the law does not prohibit. And this is under threat. And interestingly, it's under threat with a debate on tax avoidance. What, you know, Margaret Hodges and people like this are saying is that, I mean, she said it publicly. She said when she summoned, you know, the managers of various multinational corporations, she said, Yes, what you are doing is legal, but it's immoral. Now, she doesn't have a right to say this, and this is the threat. If I have a right to build a house that is 10 meter high, that's what the law says, you know, house no more than 10 meter high. I can build that house at 9 meter 99 centimeters. What I don't want is some official to say, yes, but you know, um, I don't like the architecture of the house. It's gross. It's bad taste. Or, uh, and you know, you're, you're, there's going to be a gay bar in that house. Uh, I, I, you know, it's immoral. That is not what an official may do. The official reads the law and says, yes, you have a right to do it. 
an official doesn't have a right to tell you it's moral, it's immoral, it's uh, you know, bad taste, it's whatever. Simply look at the law, apply it. Now, the problem is when you start to have people, now we, of course, have our moral values, our way of life, and, and so on, but we are not state officials. So the problem is arbitrary power. In other words, when you can twist the law as an official, then we are all under threat. Because you go and say, this is in the law. Yeah, but I don't like it. So you go to jail. Hey, hang on, <laughs> you know, where does that come from? So we have to keep this discipline. You are a government official. You can only do what the law requires that you do. We are subjects. We may do anything that is not strictly prohibited. If you don't like it, change the law. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You. Yeah, hang, hang a bit. No, hang a bit. Hang a bit. Jan's. Sorry. We have got an order here. Uh, Jan. Um, the, uh, you talk next to me. We'll come back next. So called class, so called struggle, and it's so called inevitable that we're all so called self interested. Um, are we having any real effect on it? Or, or, or can we, are we just intellectual observers? Or are we having an effect that that's the inevitable effect that we're bound to have whether we want it to do it or not? I mean, I, well, how does the libertarian ideological movement fit in with this? Is it just epiphenomenal rather than causal? Or is it this causal, but it's causal according to the iron laws of economics? That, uh, uh, and that's the way it has to be. And, and the arguments we have about it are pretty general effect. I don't, well, our own laws of economics, and you know, we are human beings, we make the economy. Uh, they are things that are stupid to do, but um, you know, it's, there, there, there isn't, looking at human beings, um, there isn't sort of our own laws. Um, what I would, again, say is read Marx. Uh, what, what Marx says is that you have these technological changes, you know, the windmill, uh, the uh, harness for horses, you know, all these sort of things that bring about a change in the political structures, that bring about ideological changes, and so on. Now, what is happening today, and I think it's difficult to dispute it, is that there is a massive technological change, technological revolution taking place. I think every observer agrees on that. But we still have the political structures, the power structures of the 19th century. Nation state, you know, democracy, all this sort of thing. And that is a clash. Now, what happens when you have a clash like this is that the old ideology no longer works. People sort of, you know, like in a Groucho Marx uh, quit, say, you know, are you going to believe your own two eyes or are you going to believe me? You know, so we look with our own two eyes what's happening in the world and we look at the ideology that we have and we say, this is not giving account of a world that I'm experiencing. So what libertarians have, I think, is a better philosophy, a better ideology, a better explanation of a world that is emerging. And when, as more and more people become aware that the ideology that they have been taught in these schools of obedience, which are the school system, when they are going to be aware that, hey, this doesn't explain the world, then I think they are going to find that libertarian philosophy works better, gives a better understanding. So but it's not because you go and preach, you know, that people follow you. It's because they say, well, what I've been told doesn't work. Do you have a better explanation? Their mind is sort of clear. They don't have to change 
their mind, they simply have to adopt something because what they had no longer works. Um, oh, okay. Did you want to come back? Did you want to come back? Oh, I'll stay there. Just back to this uh, topic of um, economic determinism, which you seem to uh, have been invited about. Why do you think that it's uh, economics in this sense which is determining things? Why, why can't um, ideas, or good ideas, be determining the economic uh, structure of society? For instance, you said yourself that you thought America was freer and more productive than uh, most countries in the world, it certainly has been. Um, why can't that be the result of the ideas which are prevalent and the institutions which are prevalent in the US, which makes that country more productive? And well, determine the economic system. Um, yes, but these ideas were born when the old feudal system broke apart. So um, that is when it, you know, uh, people were looking for A, what is going to give a better account of a society that is no longer an agricultural society, but that is moving to be an industrial and trading society. The old sort of ideology of, you know, the lord, the manor, the, uh, you know, landowners and so on, um, was not viable. I mean, it, like an old theory, you know, uh, uh, like in a lab, a scientist is looking at what's happening on his, uh, uh, in his sort of, sorry, the word, yeah. And, and, and it, you know, says, well, what I've been told doesn't explain that phenomenon. So I have to find a new theory. This is what happened with the Enlightenment and uh, the birth of the bourgeoisie and industrial and so on. I think today the sort of nation state welfare state, things like this, worked very well until 1980. You know, the welfare state that we discussed before is something that Bismarck came up with. Bismarck was the first statesman who took socialism seriously. You know, he said, these guys are not crackpot, you know, theoreticians and, and so on. This is real. Socialism is a real threat. And the way you deal with socialists is you throw money at them. And Bismarck started the welfare state. Now, in 1917, after the storming of the Winter Palace, you know, Soviet Revolution and so on, the people with money turned to the state and said, guys, I'm a bit afraid here. You know, tax me. Take my money and keep them quiet you know, from money. In 1945, when the Soviets were 300 kilometers from the Rhine, people with money turned to the state in a big way and said, tax us, tax us more, throw more money at them. And in 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, when it was clear that there was no longer a socialist threat, people with money turned to the governments and said, thank you guys, you did a very good job. No Soviet revolution, we like that, and we are taking our factories to China. And the people with, you know, guns, the welfare state said, well, hang on there. You know, we made a lot of commitments, we made a lot of promises, pensions, NHS, all these good things. Well, that's your problem, mate, but I'm taking my factory to China. So now you have huge bureaucracies, huge welfare states, that are no longer funded. And that is when you need a new ideology. That is when you need a new philosophy. That is when you need a new system that will make the way we live together in this globalized world uh, not cataclysmic. Uh, have we got any more questions? Oh, Bob. Uh, back to um, back to destruction. I should have. This is just the the end of the thing. I should have said at the beginning. Um, it's not so much about waste and recycling, though that's very much a part of it. The fact is that when firms fail, what really fails? 
when business is destroyed, when a company falls, what really happens? Does something become extinct? Do people die? Well, people die all the time because of that. So the idea of destruction is misplaced. The assets that were used in one plan, business plan are now released, reabsorbed, re-enter the economy in another business plan, a better one, or one that's bad, perhaps. So there, there is literally very little destruction at all, uh, except when it pays. There are firms who are paid to knock down buildings. They are paid to destroy. But most of them, but that, that, that's a very small part of the economy, I have to say. But still, when, it, when it's value creating, then there will be destruction. But in the sense of value destruction, no. The, the desperate attempt by all firms, and personal people, personal individuals too, is to be of most use. Because it pays if, you, if you're a tall cat, unless you like your leisure rather a lot, as I do myself. So there is, in that sense, it's wrong. To, it, you, shouldn't get, you shouldn't encourage Keynesians by thinking that bombs, <laughs> the bombs make the economy better. You know, when you have to rebuild the economy and it really gets things going, you know, it really, no, it does not help at all. Not yeah. at all. Unless it only hits the buildings that were about to be knocked down by people who professionally knocked down buildings, which I don't think bombs tend to do. Um, what is this? Hmm? Uh, yeah, uh, just so something slightly different, uh, more of a women's club observation. It's one of the one of the more depressing things about the modern world is the how disappointing our actual entrepreneurs are. Uh, in big and small, uh, they they're all clamouring after state ha state handouts. If they're small or big, even but if, if, especially if you're big, you want barriers to entry. Uh, they all want the state to come in and shore up their bit. None of them, if, if, even yeah, if even if you're even if you're a young startup and you've created billions of pounds of, well, the first thing they do is rush off to panic to the politically correct lobby. None of them. You, you wait in vain for anybody to come out with a speech like Danny DeVito in Other People's Money, where he really articulates the virtues of the free market. None of them, Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, the small businessmen, none of us is that. They're all, they're all clamoring for handouts, benefits, licenses, tax breaks. It's, they are just absolutely a wretched bunch, uh, our actual <laughs> entrepreneurs. Uh, and. Uh, Though capitalism and the free market itself is marvellous, the, pe the actual people doing it, most of them, uh, I look at them and hold them in absolute kitty for themselves. Well, they're there to serve, not to leave. I, I know, yeah. But uh, so they, they I'm, just saying, I'm just saying it's very depressing that so, so, uh, practically none of them uh, are, are aware of the, of, uh, of, of, the, of the market itself. They just... Uh, you can always hope they're hypocrites. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's my point. I mean, yeah. you know, they, they don't need an ideology. Uh, they are just mm. doing business. Um, in other words, there is something called history that works through us, whether we are aware of it or not. So we do the <laughs> and we're not things. aware of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. We, 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 we do the things, um, and it's all of us doing certain things that make the emergence of a new, but not that we have planned it, not that we have organized it. Uh, so precisely there is no sort of ghost plan that says, you know, in 20 years time, this is what we will achieve. So, um, and, and this in a way is what is so frustrating and so anguishing because we have this sort of feeling that, you know, we are manipulated by history, but at the same time, we, we make it. So um, it's a um, uh, so that's one aspect. Of course, in the case of you know these companies to get there and so on, uh, well, you know they have the NSA uh, behind them and who say you know we want you to have these little chips that make sure that we can intercept your Facebook pages or you know all, all these sort of things, Google and so on. We, NSA as you know the uh, Snowden thing as you know we, we suddenly uncovered that everything was spied on, the uh, you know, CIA, NSA, all these things, uh, were working with these companies, and these companies were accomplices. So they can't do anything um, in, in the sense of saying, you know, we criticize the state and leave us alone. You know, they, they, they may not do that. 
Um, so that's uh, you know one um, one aspect. I wanted to say something else, but I um, not sure what I, I, where I'm going uh, with it. So. You just speak Isn't that more a problem of the state in that you know, when this uh, you know, system exists? That it is available for people to exploit and take advantage of, uh, they will, especially the capitalists, will see this and they just they just take advantage of it. You know, even if they are very pro-capitalist, or you know, if, if, you know, so, it really, it, you can't blame the capitalists so much for that. It's it's because the state and this apparatus exists in the first place that gives them these artificial benefits. These, you know. Yeah, I I used to know a uh, I I bad frequentation there. Companionships in uh, you know past life, and um, I used to know a, a, a French businessman who was actually uh, had, had problems with French uh, justice because he was using you know, money and, and you know and so on. And but his defense was to say, you know, when the state throws money outside the window, my job is to sit under the window, and. That, that is what they do, you know. Uh, yes, you know, the state throws money out of the window. I'll tell you what, I, I have a confession to make. I have a freedom pass, and I'm going to renew it. You know? So the state offers it to me. It's paid by you, but am I going to turn it down? And then if I turn down the freedom pass, am I going to turn down, you know, the police? Am I going to, all, all these sort of things. We live in the world that we live in. It's, so, it's more what I was saying, it's more like you know, if, if he doesn't, uh, if one uh, company doesn't take advantage of it, it's competition will. Yeah. So he's forced into the position as a capitalist to, to take the subsidies, otherwise you know, he will lose out of business. In, in a way, the state functions as the commons, as Thomas Ardin's you know, tragedy of the commons in 1968. I mean, it is, if you don't take advantage of the state, as you say, other people will, you won't be better off. And the state, anyway, will take advantage of you. <clears throat> so it is what I was saying earlier. You know, when I was saying that if you don't practice tax avoidance, uh, and by the letter of the law, I'm not at all advocating that you cheat, because they are not because you might be caught, but I think they are serious problems about cheating. But taking every advantage that the law gives you to not pay taxes is simply the symmetrical position of HMRC. HMRC is not going to say, look, Mark, you are a good guy. We know what you did you know, for these poor children and so on. Uh, I'm going to cut some of your taxes. You know, they don't have moral judgments on your life. Neither should they. So they, they play by the rules by the letter of the rule. So you should pay by the letter of the rule too. Standard. Otherwise you are not, not in a sort of equal position. It's double standard. Yeah, exactly. John? Uh, I think you said it was Thomas Harding. Uh, uh, Garrett. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so when Tony Blair says he can feel the hand of history on his shoulder, he was a very sensitive person. We didn't feel <laughs> what was going on. Yes, it's Unlike right. the rest of us. Yeah. Who think we're autonomous and have some uh, real independent input, uh, influence on the world. We're, we're deluded. Well, he he, right. probably he is deluded as well, because sitting in number 10, you know, in the same office of Gladstone, Israeli, Churchill, and all these people, he believed that the hand of history, oh, you know, when, uh, was on his uh, shoulder. Um, but not more than it is on yours. Um, there is maybe a little different. Actually, someone I don't like, but Oswald Ostal, uh, Spengler uh, said something which is very elitist. He says, you have people who die for something, for a cause, for king and country, for the revolution. And they are the ones who make history, or so even. And the rest, they die of something. They die of old age, of illness, and so on. And they are what history is made of. <clears throat> they don't make history. They are the stuff of history. The anonymous, but the millions of anonymous that are simply you know, pushed 
by history. It's a very elitist uh, view, but I think there is maybe something about it, not in terms that it really changes history, but in terms of how people see themselves in history. You know, are you the sort of person who believes that he's dying for something or she's dying for something, or are you simply living a life where at the end of your life you will look yourself in a, in a mirror, you know, and say, well, what have I done? I just like to say, wants to come back on this reification of history. Yeah. <laughs> it's turning of history. Personification. Sorry? Personification of history. But also, mm. uh, it, uh, there's another word that slips my mind. Anyway, it's uh, turning it into a moral agent is, um, uh, it's just really sort of fit the way things are to me. It's, uh, uh, I can't remember who said history is just one damn thing after another, but I think that's uh, it's Henry Fisher. Ford. Uh, H.L. Fisher. Yeah. I, think I thought it was Henry <laughs> Ford. <laughs> that's part of it. It's Henry Ford or it's H.L. Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's Fisher, the uh, uh, history of Europe. Guy. History of Europe. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thought he said one goddamn thing after yeah. the other. Yeah. He said it was Bunkum. Yeah, he was Bunkum. Yeah. But, but, but Marx himself said that it's, it's, yeah, many people, as, as you know, he says it's it, what you said, real men, men make history, not history makes men. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, on a point of information, uh, someone said, I don't know who, that the um, uh, society is divided into two classes. Those who think society is divided into two classes, those who don't. Yes. <laughs> That's a matter of opportunity. That's a good thing. Yes, you can define. I mean, Marx himself says in the preface to Capital, you can define classes as you like, but what matters is their, ec their common economic interests. That's exactly what Marx got wrong. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. all right to classify it as bourgeois and proletariat, oh, but they had no well, common well, interests. Well, well, that was what's wrong with the theory. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I'm not sure about this theory, because I, there is, if, if you know, you adopt my view, and not only my view, but, uh, you know, who are the protagonists in the class struggle. There is definite class solidarity among state employees and, and the people who are subsidized by state employees, not the lackeys. Uh, but the, uh, you know, you talk to civil servant and, you know, in Britain, even more so in France, they function as a class. You know, they, they are imbued with this notion that we are the civil service. So it's a, um, uh, and generally they have a bit of contempt for uh, you know, people who are not in the uh, civil service. So uh, less so here because you are a nation of shopkeepers, so you have more <laughs> reverence for trade. But the, uh, you know, in, on the continent, uh, there is a definite you know, contempt for people who make money as opposed to people who are, who have their eyes on you know, the higher summits. And uh, okay. I say they've managed to redefine the working class as a government employee, the Labour Party. So when they talk about the working class, what they're really talking about often is government employees. I don't think they are, are they? No. Well, I'm, I'm sure the minimum wage applies to government employees, isn't it? Oh, it will do, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the Labour Party don't think... I mean, they're the Labour, the aren't they? they don't think that they're only in favour of the government employees, do they? They think they're in favour of the private... Well, that, that, is, that, that, is a neurosis. That, that is a neurosis I was mentioning uh, earlier. You know, they cannot say, well, what we want is our interest. They have to say we are serving the common good. And um, so it's, you know, that, that sort of contradiction that, that they um, experience, that they live, and uh, which is a kind of neurosis, because um, they uh, have to uh, shut their, their desire, they have to negate their desire and um, kind of express it. So anyone else who wants to? No. Well, so we can uh, so we continue the discussion at the bar then? Thank you very much indeed, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely talk. I'm sorry I... Uh, but, uh, yeah, when you mentioned Mark, I'm a bit like an